Well, I don't know if it's encouraging when I get up to preach that Megan loudly calls out, shh. <laughs> but I think it might have been directed to the baby, so I'm okay, right? All right. Well, let me, uh, let me ask you a couple of questions as we begin. Most people would uh, probably answer in the affirmative, but do you like to sing as part of the church service? Yes? Did you know that Jan Hus, one of the reformers, was burned at the stake for heresy, and in his heresy trial, one of the main points for which he stood condemned was this, quote, encouraging the congregation to sing. So you guys are all going to burn if they ever get back in power. How about this? Do you appreciate reading your Bibles? You like that, right? Yeah? You like to have a Bible at church sometimes? Well, again, you probably know the story, but another of the reformers, William Tyndall, was executed for the crime of translating the Bible into English. Well, these are things that we deeply appreciate and benefit from today, and so already we are intimately and personally engaged in an appreciation for the era known as the Great Reformation. But on a day-to-day -day practical basis, there's another area where the Reformation is very helpful, and it's what we'll ultimately reflect on this morning, and I think that it will help you in your daily walk, and that is this. You don't have to answer this one you know, with hands up if you don't want to, but do you find that you struggle daily with sin? Even the same sins over and over and over and over and over and over. Well... These last few weeks have been, you know, a time of interesting decoration around here. Most of the ones in here have come down, but coming in you still would have seen some of the more fascinating decorations that were on offer here. And I wore my orange shirt today because I'm an orangeman? No, what was it? Something happened recently. I don't remember. There was a holiday, right? Do you guys remember what it was? A couple days ago, October 31st. Who can tell me what it was? That's right, it was Reformation Day. I knew that you guys would know the correct answer. And then yesterday, we celebrated another wonderful milestone. Do you remember what we celebrated yesterday? All Saints Day. These are two days that look back at the history of the church. And before we go on, let me just take a minute to remind us of what's going on there. And Of course, the reason why I'm motivated to do that is because we celebrated the Halloween festivities here. And like you guys, I had to go through, and my wife together with me, discussing again, what are we going to do with our kids? How are we going to participate? And we were driving around our neighborhood, noticing once again that year on year, it seems to have gotten more gory again. Uh, in fact, quite cutely, my three-year-old Titus, he is not here, so I can tell a story on him. Yes! Uh, and he came in the house and said, Daddy! I said, what? He said, we need to call the police! I said, we do? Why? George has a dead guy in his yard! which is our neighbor. So we were debating, do we want, how much do we want to expose them to, and, and then what's of value and what should we be teaching them. And really, we want to make sure that we teach our kids at least as much about the Christian holidays as the pagan one. Several weeks ago, Titus was able to say, I'm so excited about Halloween. I said, why? Because you go to people's house and they give you candy. I hope he can remember something else. I tried to teach him. It was also Reformation Day, but... And then I gave him a Bible, but he didn't think that was quite as good. But anyway, <laughs> hopefully he grows into it. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 1.15, For my part, I am eager to preach the gospel. And he was eager even to suffer death for the gospel if that was necessary. And the lofty thing that the gospel held up, Paul came to his crescendo of Romans chapter 1 in verse 17, where he specifies that through the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. For as it is written, the just or the righteous shall live by faith. And it was on this question regarding righteousness and faith that the Reformation turned. The singing of songs, the Bible in the English language, and the preaching of the Reformation was all directed at this one central message. And Charles Spurgeon reminds us that it is this one sentence, the just shall live by faith, which produced the Reformation. He writes, or preached, out of this one line, as from the opening of one of the apocalyptic seals, 
came forth all that sounding of gospel trumpets and all that singing of gospel songs, which made in the world a sound like the noise of many waters. This one seed, forgotten and hidden away in the dark medieval times, was brought forth and dropped into the human heart, made by the Spirit of God to grow, and in the end, to produce great results. Really, as we think about what we should have reflected on a little bit with our families this weekend, is that we are privileged to have a plethora of sermons and books and Bibles and songs that give us the answer to the question, how shall we be righteous and thus live? Or how shall we obtain salvation or deliverance or rescue from sin and all of its consequences? During the Reformation, you know that this was debated on two battlefronts. It was debated on the authority question. What authority could we trust to answer the question, how can a person be righteous? Or how can a person be saved from sin and all its consequences? What authority is secure enough that we can have confidence in it? And the second battlefront was the answer the Reformation got to this question when they took the Bible as their authority. Let me tell you just a little bit about the Halloween weekend as I refresh my mind on it again this weekend. Halloween has always been a part of the celebration of All Saints Day. And it was actually originally a wonderful celebration of the church where uh, people would prepare for a special day of celebrating those who had gone behind them on November 1st by a day of prayer and fasting on the 31st. As things developed, especially in the British Isles, it came to be that on All Saints Day you could go and see some bones of Saint so-and-so or some milk from Mary's breast. And when you did that, all your sins would be forgiven. No, literally. That's, yeah. Uh, And (laughs) there are um, 127 vials remaining in Europe of milk from Mary's breast, in case you're curious. Um, Not certain that they're authenticated, okay, but (laughs) but they are claimed. Uh, And... (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that threw me off. Uh, <laughs> and it came to be that on All Saints Day, the saints would intervene for you and take away all your sins. And so, what did you begin to do on October 31st? Have a little fun. So it became the great party day of the year when misbehavior and misdemeanors were overlooked because they would all be wiped out the next day. And your odds of dying in a 24-hour period were pretty low, so you're probably certain your sins would soon be forgiven. This day also coincided with a more ancient pagan holiday known as Samhain. And no matter what you see on the Internet, we actually don't know what happened on that day because it's through the ancient myths of history we have completely lost it. All that we know about it is that it had to do with the crop rotation cult. And in the fall, the harvest would come up, and the crops would die, and the cold weather, and by illustration, the snow, would come and symbolize the end of the living period of the year and the beginning of the dead period of the year. And so it was thought at this time that death, the god death, gained ascendancy and power. And in his power, the spirits of the departed also gained power. And hence the ghoulish nature that we now attribute to Halloween. This dark time became a time when evil reigned and people were actually quite terrified. Jack-o'-lanterns were originally designed because it was believed that the spirits of the dead would be attracted to the light and then trapped inside the jack-o'-lantern. So that's what that was about. And so all these pieces came in there. When Christianity flourished and became dominant, it banished all this fear and it substituted hope in its place. The dead were not apparitions to fear, but saints to be thankful for. That's the way it all started. They watched over believers and prayed for them in heaven was the idea, and thus all saints day. But as I already intimated, that quickly fell back into darkness when it became an excuse for sin. (laughs) And then the question began to come for the reformers, can these saints really help us? And 500 years ago during the Reformation, as it was all reassessed, it was determined that that holiday had gotten off course, not in its origins, but where it had gone. And so they wanted to change the tone of All Saints season. And so they made sure that on the 31st, there was a celebration of Reformation Day when the heroes of the Reformation and the doctrines of the Reformation were remembered. So that we meditated on those as we came to remember our past on All Saints Day. And theoretically, that's our tradition, and that's what we should be keeping to. 
but candies are a pretty powerful draw. So there's your history. Dark pagan time of fear and haunting from the dead, replaced by celebration of joy for example and help from the dead, and then after the Reformation, a refocus on remembering and honoring those who went before us, but focusing on Christ, hence October 31st, Reformation Day, November 1st, All Saints Day. November, October 31st, uh, coincidentally, became a great day for Reformation Day because it was on that day in 1517 that Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the Wittenberg Church. So next time you're in one of those quiz shows where they say, what date was it that Martin Luther nailed? Then you'll know. <laughs> well, hey, nobody remembers that history, but we do. So, let me tell you a little story about Martin Luther and how he personified the hope and help that was discovered in the Reformation. You know him, and I've talked about him before, but it's always valuable to go back to Luther because he's funny. <laughs> he was a German professor of theology and a pastor of a village church. His university was new and small, and probably in his day had a student body of about 30. His church was insignificant and off the beaten path and had nobody there but peasants and a few landlords. And yet, it was this man that would bequeath first to Europe and ultimately to the world a revived Christian conscience that would come in to be the heart of the modern West in its politics, its finance, its government, its education, and more. The title of a relatively new book about Luther bears this out. It's called The Reformation, How a Monk with a Mallet Changed the World. Dr. Roland Baton, a Yale history professor, has written, If there is any sense remaining of Christian civilization in the West, this man Luther is in no small measure deserving of the credit. It's a pretty, pretty important life. One guy. One seemingly crazy guy. Today, there are approximately 600 million members of the Protestant Christian Church, all of whom trace their ancestry in some way to Martin Luther. All this starts, of course, in what scholars have called the medieval period. It's called the Dark Ages, but not really for the reasons we typically think. It was actually a time of great invention, fascinating discoveries and rediscoveries. But why it was so dark was because it was a depressing time. The classical view of the world espoused in the Greco-Roman Empire had competing philosophies in it, but its general tone was one of hope and growth and empire and glory. And that was lost in the barbarian invasions. And because Christianity had fallen into a dark time where the gospel was hidden, it was a world with a lot of chaos and very little hope. Did you know the life expectancy during the medieval period was about 30 years? So if anybody in this room is over the age of 30, you're already dead. Or you're like the oldest person in the village. And you have no teeth. We do associate this, of course, with some of the more romantic elements, like knights and their ladies, right? And just to give you a little thing on that, your glorious knight in shining armor, when he would become a knight, would have a special investiture service, previous to which he would bathe and cover himself in sweet-smelling perfumes. And of course, this would be the one bath he would take in his life. So ladies, you can chase your knight. To put it into more bleak terms, and it's helpful for us to understand this, for in a minute you'll understand why. Even among the kings of Europe, with the most wealth and privilege and the best of everything, only about half their children reach their 20s. It would be very common in a family to have 10, 12 kids and to have one or two of them live. That would be your normal life. At Winchester College, which was a public school, which in Britain means a private school here, that is where those who had the means to send their children and pay for them went. They boarded 70 boys from the most prosperous homes and who were well looked after. 12 of these 70 died in 1401 and 20 during the 1431 school year as typical years, kind of low and high. So you imagine that, send your kids to school. Mm, there's about an 80% chance they'll come back. Is that the way we think about school today? Well, have fun on the bus, hope you make it back. <laughs> So death was so real, it just wasn't possible for it to be hidden. I find it weird today when we hide death so well that we sort of ghoulishly celebrate it on the, on the, on the Halloween streets like my poor kid found with the body next door. This wouldn't have been 
cool in this day because all, what it did was reminded all your neighbors of all their dead children. Not really a great celebratory party, right? Into the short, hard life they lived it was also added the brutal hardships of war and disease. The Black Death, for instance, had just stalked Europe and taken out maybe a third of its population. Absolutely amazing. They're already losing all these people on a regular basis. Sickness comes into the village. <laughs> third gone. Maybe the whole village gone. Now, if you lived in that kind of world, a world in which you expected imminently to stand before God and enter your eternal destiny, what would be the most important question you would ask? It's kind of obvious. <laughs> how can I make sure I'm okay with God? Or in the theological terms, how can a person be justified as righteous before God? This is an old, old question. Perhaps 4,000 years ago, Job asked it this way. How can a man be in the right before God? Job 9.6. 3,000 years ago, David asked, How can a young man keep his way pure? Psalm 119.9. Solomon appealed to a lack of self-knowledge. How can a man even understand his way? Proverbs 20.24. 20, and Paul, in the New Testament days, cries out in Romans 7.24, Who will deliver me from this body of sin and death? And while today our lives are immeasurably better in the physical realm, and we live much more than twice as long as the old average, and our health is better, and we don't suffer through all the deprivations, at least in this country, we have to realize that all it does is mask the same reality that we live in a spiritual realm, that God is still king of all, and that one day we must face him. Hebrews 9.27 says, It is appointed for man to die once, and after that, to face judgment. That's the part our culture skips on. We say, yeah, everyone's got to die sometime. It's going to happen. Maybe, maybe push it back as far as we can. Maybe take it now on your own terms. Some, you've got to die sometime. But the Bible says, but after that, we face judgment. So we want to make sure that we know how we measure up in that day. And it is the lesson of the Reformation that really brings that home to us. Again, think in practical terms. What could you say to a depressed, fearful, suffering person today? Well, medicine's pretty good. Don't worry about it. They'll get you through this. And what they really need to know is how they can be justified in the face of God's perfect righteousness. And of course, at this point, I hope everyone in this room will come up with a simple answer. Well, you believe in Jesus, dummy. Aren't you the pastor? You should know this. That's, of course, right. But... We do need to be a little bit more thoughtful than that. I'm going to invite you now to turn to John chapter 2 with me. The Gospel of John is the fourth Gospel of the New Testament. The last one that was written. It includes a lot of information about conversations Jesus had. A lot of interesting details. In John chapter 2, verse 23, we see that Jesus has just done a whole sequence of very powerful miracles, including turning the water into wine at the wedding in Cana. And in verse 23, we read that while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name. Okay, they believed in Jesus. When they saw the signs that he was doing, that he must be the Messiah. Verse 24 says, But Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them, because he knew all people, and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. This is a really interesting passage that probably most of us haven't studied in detail. In verse 23, you see many believed in his name. That's the Greek word pistevo. In verse 24, you see, but Jesus did not entrust himself to them. Entrust is also the same Greek word pistevo. It's exactly the same. It's really quite fascinating. It could be translated, many believed in him, but Jesus in heart, his part did not believe them for himself. Because he knew all people and he knew what was in man. What a strange text. He knew it was in man. Now he'll go on to explain in chapter 6 and other places that what is in man is an evil bent nature with which we are all born with corruption and sin. Remember Genesis 6, 5, it said, the thoughts and intents of man's heart was only evil continually. That's the core problem. With the problem in the medieval period, it's the problem in our time, that we have a bent towards evil. 
So our children, as sweet as they are, don't need to be trained to be naughty. They need to be trained to be good. I have never struggled with getting my kids to fight with one another. You might have. <laughs> but I struggled to get them to be kind to one another. That's because they have that bent, and they need to be structured and trained in God's truth and called to the gospel. That's why, and you know this language, Jesus will go on in chapter 3 with Nicodemus to explain that what's really needed is a change, which we know as being born again, or born from above. The Holy Spirit comes and takes out that sinful core and replaces it with a Godward heart. We know that language, but that's what it's really talking about. So even to say in simplicity, just believe in Jesus, really isn't the answer that we need to have. In fact, Martin Luther would have been told to believe in Jesus in the medieval dark days. And yet, he wasn't comfortable. Then it is interesting that we begin to find in scriptures the great truth that we know if we've been changed by our behavior. I won't get into that, but just so I'll give you two verses. 1 John 3, 7. Little children, make sure that no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. And verse 10, by this... It's evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. So someone can say, I believe in Jesus, but then live a wicked, evil life and hope they're going to be okay. And that pastor would say, no, you're not. So let me press this point home so that you feel the same way that Martin Luther did. And I certainly hope to discourage and depress you so you leave here miserable. No, I'm kidding. But I want you to feel the pressure that Martin Luther felt before I tell you the way he came to understand the solution. Again, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil. By this is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Do you still struggle with sin? How does it make you feel? Do you regularly practice righteousness? Or do you regularly practice sin? What characterizes your life? Are you ever tempted to give up and just give in to your sin? Do you maybe lie awake at night groaning because the power that sin seems to be exercising in your life? Is it blocking your spiritual link to God? You can't read your Bible, you can't pray. What hope lays before you and what can you do? Flip in your Bibles now to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9. I guess if I go to 1 Corinthians, it'll make more sense there. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Very similar message is delivered to the believers in Galatia. Let me read this one to you. Galatians 6, 7, and 9. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he will reap. The one who sows to his flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. The one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not grow weary. This is a universal biblical truth. Everywhere we look, the unrighteous don't go to heaven. The righteous go to heaven. When you claim God's grace and then live in sin, you mock His grace. And the book of Hebrews has much to say about that. The book of James says, You show me your faith by your works. Oh, got that wrong. I'll show you my faith by my works. For faith without works is a dead faith. The Bible teaches the true believer, 1 Peter 4.1, has ceased from sin. It's a powerful statement. 1 Peter 4.1, the believer has ceased from sin. John, 1 John 3.9, no one who is born of God practices sin. Because God's seed abides in him, he cannot sin because he is born of God. If you read your Bibles, these kind of passages should trouble you. Because I don't think any of us can truly say that we have ceased from sin. That's why the Reformation question should make sense to all of us. How can a person be in the right before God? 
Born in 1483 in Eiselbahn, Saxony, Germany, Martin Luther was raised in a devout and socially rising middle-class family. His father desired him to study law, and so he went to the University of Erfurt in 1501 and spent four years in legal studies. He excelled as a student and was well on his way into stepping out into the world as an important person. But Luther read these kinds of things, heard these kind of teachings, and his soul was in turmoil. According to one biographer, Luther at times was severely depressed. And the reason lay not in any personal frictions, but in the malaise of existence intensified by religion. In that secular writer's analysis, this is essential, he writes, There is nothing whatsoever to set Luther off from his contemporaries, let alone explain why later he should have revolted against so much medieval religion. There's just one respect in which Luther appears to have been different from other youths of his time, namely that he was extraordinarily sensitive and subject to reoccurring periods of depression of spirit. That's the way a historian reads Luther. Now, what was happening in Luther's own words and biblically was that in his search for hope, he became a student of the book of Romans. And he was particularly obsessed, he says. He uses that word. He was obsessed with Romans 1.17, which said in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. And in this, Luther heard the thunderings of God's law or the requirements or instructions of God. He had heard much in his life about the righteousness of God and the scripture he spent time studying at this point, the Latin Vulgate translation, read in such a way that Romans 1.17 seemed clearly to say that the phrase, the righteousness of God, meant the gospel revealed the righteous standard of God kind of verses I just read. Does not sin, cannot sin, do not be deceived, will not enter heaven. And then he thought the gospel was the capstone to that kind of teaching. And in the gospel we were told that only the righteous shall live. Rather than being good news, the gospel for Luther became the most terrible of news. It became the final nail in the coffin of his struggling conscience. And then he read Romans 1, 18-19. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men since the righteousness of God is revealed. The wrath of God was also revealed. All because of the gospel, as Luther saw it. The gospel meant God's wrath was being poured out on us all. And for a person conscious of their own sin, as Luther certainly was, this was a cause for fear, great fear. And so young law student Martin, getting ready to graduate, was out for a horse ride one day. You know this story. Suddenly a storm rose up. He became a little bit afraid because everybody died in the medieval world. And lightning was flashing around him. And lightning killed people in the medieval world. And one clap of lightning came so close beside him that it threw his horse, threw him down. He crashed onto the ground, rolled into the ditch, terrified for his life, fearing that he was a sinner and knowing he was not right before God, cried out to the only person he thought could help him. A saint. (laughs) Saint Anne, save me, he said. Get me out of God's wrath, and I'll serve you in a monastery. Well, good old Saint Anne apparently came through because Luther made it through the storm. And of course, Luther joined his monastery. But as he was in the monastery, he began to be even more discouraged. Because he did everything the monastic rule told him to do. He looked at all the orders and he said, what is the strictest and worst of all the monasteries? That's what he said. He said, okay, I'll join it. The Augustinian order. They are the absolute most vicious. They will make me work the hardest and do the most things and I'll be safe. And he did it and he did it and he did it. And then he said he reflected on Romans 3.10. Which says this, none is righteous No, not one. So he worked harder. (laughs) I'll be the one, he thought. He he began to think, well, this doesn't make any sense. Why did God give us the Bible? If we're going to follow everything he says and it's not good enough, what's the point? What's the point? Luther says this, I kept the rule of my order so strictly that I may say that if ever a monk got to heaven by his monkery, it was I. All of my brothers in the monastery who knew me will bear me out. If I had kept on any longer, I should have killed myself with vigils, prayers, readings, and other work. He stayed up all night, 
fasting, praying, and reading scripture and spiritual books. Couldn't find anyone. Romans 3.19 told him, Now we know that whatever the law instructs, it instructs to those who are under the law. And he said, Well, I know, I get all this. And then he read in verse 20, So that everyone may, every mouth may be shut up and all would be accountable before God. He was guilty. He knew he was guilty. Where would he turn? Well, I hope you get enough of a sense to feel what Luther felt at that time. And then I want you to see how Luther felt now when he turned out. Luther then went to the medieval church and said, okay, I need help. What is the best help you can give me? And he went to the greatest teachers and the greatest movements of the day. And there were three distinct tracks of advice that he received. Here they were, really in no particular order. Number one, if you can't fulfill the conditions of the law, Martin, someone else can. There are certain righteous people with a capital R, so righteous that they surpassed God's standards. And they can share their righteousness with you, the saints. Just ask them. They'll give you their righteousness. Hmm. Okay. Second piece of advice. Remember, Martin, there are sins and then there are sins. And this would become known as mortal and venal sins, for those of you who know that language. Luther was told, stop worrying. He was literally told this in the confessional booth by his priest. Do not come back to the confessional until you have a real sin like patricide to repent of. If you'll kill your parents, come back here. Until then, leave me alone. I guess that message was, chill out, man. Let someone else be righteous. Chill out, man. And then the third track he was told was, work harder. Don't just say you're sorry. Do penance. Do penance. Say some Hail Marys. Walk barefoot. And Luther looked at all these and said, Are you kidding me? No one is righteous. No, not one. I can't get somebody else's righteousness. Try harder. By the works of the flesh, no one will be justified. Only worry about big sins. Do not be deceived. Neither this, nor that, nor this, nor that will ever enter the kingdom of heaven. In fact, Revelation tells us all liars will find their place in the lake of fire. He pretty much literally said that. Are you kidding me? This is completely useless. And he realized there was nothing in the church that could help him. So he went back to the scriptures. And then he says he began to hate God. There's, there's, that's, that's, what else are you going to do? He says, I began to hate God, and I began to commit blasphemy. All this, by the way, as a priest, serving in his local church, teaching theology at the seminary. We don't know any professors like that, right? <laughs> he says, I greatly long to understand Paul's epistle to the Romans, because he was lecturing through it at the university. And nothing stood in the way but that one expression, the righteousness of God, because I took it to mean the righteousness whereby God is righteous and deals righteously in punishing the unrighteous. My situation was that although an impeccable monk, I stood before God as a sinner troubled by conscience, and I had no confidence that my merit would assuage him. Therefore, I did not love a just and angry God, but rather I hated and murmured against him. That's where Luther came to. Totally done. Then he ran into an interesting fellow. Actually, another Augustinian monk, who, as it was interesting enough, studied Augustine. What a thing to do as an Augustinian monk. And he became uh, one of the leaders in the Brethren of the Common Order. Don't worry about that. It was a kind of a spiritual revitalization movement. And so Stupitz looked at Luther. Not Stupids. Staupitz. It's German. Okay. Good old Stupitz. Staupitz. All right. He said to Luther, you know what, Luther? I told you he was uh, a priest already, but this is where he got assigned to his village church. He was doing priestly work amongst the monks. And Staupitz said to him, just go work with peasants for a while. You're a navel gazer. All you do is look at yourself all day thinking about how bad you are. Go see people with real problems and help them. So he went. And Staupitz thought, well, if he's busy doing that, he's going to find solutions for them, and that'll be the solutions he needs for himself. 
It was kind of wise advice, actually, in Luther's case. However, this became even worse for poor Martin because he found that everyone had the same kind of problems that he had. And, of course, if he couldn't find any answers for himself, how could he give answers to these poor peasants? And they were all having hope in these three solutions the church gave, and he knew they were false. So he said to the poor peasant, what are you putting your hope in? He says, oh, I know the saints are taking care of me. And his heart broke. He said, they're not, you fool! <laughs> and the person said, well, I know that I sin a lot, but it's not that bad. And he said, yes, it's terrible! God will send you to hell! And the other said, I work really hard. I'm, I'm going to... He says, it doesn't matter how hard you work, you're done. Well, you can imagine this church was a cheery place to be. <laughs> and at that moment, the Pope wanted to build a basilica in Rome. And so he sent a fundraising campaign throughout Europe in which a theological construct called indulgences were to be used to raise funds. An indulgence was simply the belief, as we said, that there was others who were holy enough to have extra holiness that we could get a hold of. And the Pope ultimately was in charge of that holiness. And so he could dispense to you a dispensation of grace. And if you received that, it would wipe out some certain amount or all of your sins. So to raise money, they decided the great way to do this would be to take the Pope's great coffer of righteousness and sell them. And Johann Tetzel was a young monk from a rival order those terrible Benedictines. Nobody likes them. And he came into this Augustinian territory and he began to sell these indulgences. And he had a cool little thing. You may have heard it. It's his nice little ditty. He said to people, you have to buy these indulgences, not just for you, not just for you, but for your dead mother. Think about your mother. Oh, how she suffers now in the sufferings of hell. And he began to preach, and I've read some of his transcripts. He would say stuff like, the devils are there with their pitchforks, shoving them in your mother's bottom. And he would go on with this, and the people would begin to wail and cry. And he would say, but there is hope, because the Pope loves you. He has brought you a solution that will free you and rescue your mother. An indulgence. By which all sins now and forever will be forgiven for either you or whomever you choose to buy this for. Remember, he said, when the penny in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. Martin Luther was walking between his office and the church one day and he saw a young woman from one of the families that he ministered to and she had a big grin on her face. And she ran up to him and said, Father Martin, Father Martin, it's such a good day. And he said, why? Why is it such a good day? And she says, you know how my little brother is sick and dying? He says, yes, I know I've been praying for him. And my mother gave me some money to go to the next town and get some medicine that we hoped would save his life. And Martin says, oh, good, you must have got it. He says, no, I got something better. I ran into this guy named Tetzel, and now I've got an indulgence for my brother so I can be sure he will go to heaven. And she, he said, let me see it. And she passed it to him, and he opened it up. And he says, at that moment, he rolled it back up, handed it into the young woman's hands, and left determined to kill himself. But God got a hold of him in that moment and he decided that maybe as a doctor of theology, maybe as a minister in God's church, maybe as someone who had all of the resources that God had given, he had an obligation to do something. Not yet saved. <laughs> but he felt he had to do something to help this young woman. So he came up with a series of questions. He thought, if I could answer these questions, I could help her. And he kept writing, and he kept writing, and it turned out there were 95 questions. <laughs> and he decided he would debate them with someone who supported this indulgence sale. And so as any good scholarly debater would do, he went to the door of the castle church, and he posted up his points of debate. Interestingly enough, Gutenberg had just invented something called the printing press. <laughs> and one of his disciples happened to be there and saw this interesting debate that was to be done in Latin by a couple of professors at the university and said, wow. That's interesting. I bet people would want to know about that. So he pulled it off the door, translated it into German, reposted it for the scholars, took it to his printer friend, 
who then printed it and sent it all across Europe. And people began to read these questions. Can the Pope really distribute the righteousness of the saints? Can we be righteous by God in this way? And they begin to ask these questions, and it wasn't just a couple of scholars now, it was the whole world asking these questions. And one of, one of the 95 theses Luther has, the reflection in there, <laughs> could the righteousness comes the Holy Spirit be purchased? He says, did not Peter say to Simeon the sorcerer, your money perish with you, for you thought you could purchase the Spirit of God? And then he said, didn't the gospel or cry out, come and drink without cost? And it was just as this was going on that a miracle occurred. The miracle that saved Martin Luther. He began the printing press, another great technological advancement. Did you know that in 1514, nobody in Europe had a Bible, of course, in their own language, but nobody even had it in the original languages. Nobody had a Bible in Greek. They had a Latin translation that was a thousand years old. It was pretty good. That's all they had. But more, no more people didn't speak Latin. Luther had been reading it in Latin, but then all of a sudden, Erasmus had made a trip around Europe and gathered up all the fragments of Greek manuscripts he could find, and he put them all into edition and published it, and it was actually about two months prior to the posting of the 95 Theses that he published his Greek New Testament. Luther got a hold of one of the very first ones as a university professor. And he opened it up and he said, well, this is interesting. Now, they did know Greek because they read, you know, the ancient Greeks, but, but not that. So Luther opened up his Greek New Testament and he looked at it. And he came across Romans 1, 17. And the Vulgate said it was the righteousness upheld by God that was revealed in the gospel. And the Greek said it was the righteousness which is freely given by God. Here's Luther's words. Night and day I pondered until I saw the connection between the righteousness of God and the statement the righteous shall live by faith. I grasped the truth with the righteousness of God is the righteousness whereby through grace and sheer mercy He justifies us by faith. We think, yeah, well, duh. Well, yeah, because we've experienced that for 500 years. He never had. Nobody knew this. Nobody. Nobody taught this in the whole world. And then he says, thereupon, I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through the open doors into paradise. The whole scripture took on a whole new meaning. And whereas before the righteousness of God had filled me with hate, now it became to me inexpressibly sweet and greater love. And this passage of Paul became a gateway to heaven. I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God unto salvation, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed for us. Just as it is written, the righteous shall live by that faith. Romans 3, 21-26 suddenly made sense to Luther and he went into his class and actually taught on it. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from his instructions, apart from the law, although the law and the prophet bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus for all who believe. And this was published and spread like wildfire across Europe. Faith was the answer for salvation. And faith remains the answer for living the Christian life. Well, my introduction is complete. And I'm prepared to preach on the text I prepared for this morning. <laughs> so I think I may just delay it till next week. Carl, you'll have to do some more theme song, sorry. Luther, having answered how can a person be justified before a righteous God, also went on to answer how can a person live righteously before God. And I know that you really want to know that. And so you'll come back next week. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth that was rediscovered in the Reformation. It is a truth that we generally know. And I suspect that everyone in this room gives assent to. And yet it is a truth that we all need to realize afresh to realize that we are hopeless and helpless apart from you. As we look at this city bustling around us in the falling snow, we know that so many people don't even know what we know. And they are going through this life in fear of death. 
And as Halloween has been celebrated, they've attempted to push that aside by making humor, making jest, making light of death and a culture of death, pushing away all of their fears into this night. And we pray for their salvation. We pray that we would be witnesses who know the truth, that we would encourage our neighbors, our friends, our relatives, our co-workers, and say, I know it's a scary world. I see the same things you do. But I also know there's hope. We have a solution. And may we share with confidence your truth. Lord, I, I do pray if there is anyone in this room yet struggling, not certain that they are in the right with you, that they would remember the truth of your gospel, that you sent your son to die for our sins, and that he was raised again for our justification. That is what Jesus did on the cross so many years ago was done so that we could be right before you here and now and forever. May our trust and hope only be in you.